Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. One fear tyranny and sought a government that would not intrude upon the lives of people. The other feared the mob and wanted a government that would make people behave. As both men fought and struggled to build a nation, Europe dreamed of paradise across the Atlantic. The American Republic, this time on the Western tradition. Now UCLA professor Eugen Weber's continuing journey through the history of Western civilization. Given the incompetence of English soldiers and politicians in the American War of Independence, given French aid, given factors like distance and a large measure of luck, we can furnish some explanations of how the colonists finally won. But then, when the fighting was over, we can also see the development of conflict in the American camp between moderates and radicals, between the conservatives, the stabilizers, and the party of change and movement. It was, in essence, a classic revolutionary situation after the revolution was over. One group was made up largely of the early revolutionary leaders who had been quite willing to go to war to get independence, men like Jefferson or Richard Henry Lee of Virginia. These people liked the Articles of Confederation that had been agreed on during the war because they were pretty loose and ineffective and because they embodied the conviction that the greatest political gain of the revolution was the independence of the several states. The weaker the Confederation was, the more independent the states were. The more independent the states were, the better they liked it. The men who opposed this group had on the whole come into the revolution more reluctantly. Men like Alexander Hamilton or Robert Livingston of New York. Most of them believed that the new nation should have a central government with power to coerce both the state government and the citizens. They were conservative in their politics, they were conservative in their social standing, men of principle and men of property, whose property sometimes provided a major principle. These two tendencies, these two attitudes, are best represented by two personalities, Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. And they are reflected in two documents, the Declaration of Independence, the idealistic proclamation that makes a revolution, and the Constitution, the legalistic document that is the product of compromise and of fear of further revolution. Obviously, the two attitudes were at opposite poles. There could be little compromise between those who felt that man needs only to be freed from his chains in order to move towards perfection, and those who felt that even the wisest and the strongest bars could not keep a man from making a damn fool of himself and making his neighbor miserable as well. When they looked into the future, Jefferson and his followers feared the corruptions of power. They believed that if man was saved from tyranny, he would do very well for himself. So they were for a government that would do as little as possible. When Hamilton and his followers looked into the future, they feared the corruptions of human nature. 
They believed that if man was saved from himself, there was a great future for American society. Naturally, they were for an active, interfering government that would make things happen the way they should happen, that would make people behave the way they should behave. People who were of this mind argued that the attempt at a loose government based on the Articles of Confederation was a failure. And they eventually had their way at the cost of a few compromises at the Constitutional Convention in 1787. So, while we can say symbolically that Jefferson, in the sense of the ideas he represented, that Jefferson made the revolution, we can also say with lots of reservations that Hamilton made the Constitution. And that, to a certain extent, the interesting thing about the American experiment is that it has always preserved this combination of hard-headed practice on the lines of Hamilton and Hobbes and very idealistic theory on the lines of Jefferson and Locke. So while all men were created equal, this didn't include blacks who could not marry whites, Indians who were to be driven off their lands, illiterates and paupers who weren't going to get a vote, and women, of course, who were not men. The Constitution replaced the old authority by a new one, the old monarchical ruling class by a new republican ruling class resting on property and social distinction, and eventually on heredity too, as much as the old one had done. The big difference was that Americans could not admit the hereditary and social distinctions on which their society, like every other society, was based. And this created a gap between theory and practice, between the theory of equality that united the nation and the practice of competition, competition with its unequal and selective results that kept the nation on the move and made it expand. The tension between theory and practice, between equality and competition, this tension would never be admitted, let alone resolved. The frauds and the illusions necessary to conceal it became part of American history and of history itself. And it's quite possible that without such great illusions and great deceptions too, no great nation can exist, at least not as a nation. If we look to see how this worked out in immediate practice, we glimpse, first of all, a belief in the great destiny of the new nation and a general conviction that Americans could do anything they wanted to, untrammeled by the traditions and the repressions of the old world. And nowhere was this feeling as strong as in the old world itself. Because America was a screen on which Europe could project its own ideal visions. Europe was divided and restless within itself. It was rent by the clash between the established ideas of inherited family status and privilege and the new ideas of personal merit. There was a growing demand for equality. There was growing social mobility, but not nearly enough. And that made for a more troubled class consciousness. At the same time, there was a growing elitism in Europe, both in the developing bureaucracies and in the aristocratic reaction of a class that felt threatened and reacted by asserting itself more strongly than before. And this conflicted with a vague but widespread desire among a lot of people who had been outside the political scene up to now. A desire to take part in affairs, to do good for society, to play the patriot, to act the citizen the way people like themselves had shown was possible in the new United States. And it was to America that everybody referred, from Scotland to Poland, sometimes in the most unrealistic terms, 
the indifference to fact being a kind of mirror of the feelings of the author, of the painter. A mirror, too, of the distance that turned the American continent into a mirage. They say, writes a Belgian in 1782, they say that in Virginia, the members chosen to establish the new government assembled in a peaceful wood removed from the sight of the people in an enclosure prepared by nature with banks of grass. And that in this sylvan spot, they deliberated on who should preside over them. And here is something more heroic, but equally silly, from a Frenchman with strong echoes of Plutarch and the noble Romans. The day when Washington resigned his command in the Hall of Congress, a crown set with jewels had been placed on the book of the Constitution. Suddenly, Washington seized the crown, broke it, and threw the pieces before the assembled people. How petty does the ambitious Caesar seem before this hero of America? Of course, this is a sort of fairy tale. Here we see a far more likely version of the event, but under the literary artifice and the rhetoric, you can find a kind of spiritual emigration. You can sense the psychological discomfort of Europeans, the yearning to live in a better country where solid merit would be recognized, the moral rejection of existing European society, which would be the ultimate cause of revolution there. In Europe, we are told, talent can be a sad and futile gift. But in America, the most honest, the most truly respectable was also the greatest and the most respected without reference to birth or rank. In America, there were none of the social injustices that were weighing more heavily in Europe, not because they were getting heavier, but because people were more aware of them than ever before. In America, artificial distinctions had been brushed away. As a German professor put it in 1776, the Americans are the most fortunate people on the whole earth, at least among civilized nations. They do not even know the names of many burdens borne by subjects in Europe. The professor couldn't understand why half of Europe hadn't already emigrated across the Atlantic. Of course, there were people, and Jefferson was one who tried to combat the more absurd ideas about America that circulated in Europe. But the realists were opposed by those Europeans who preferred dreams to reality, and indeed who saw that if you wanted to affect reality, only dreams could provide truly striking material. You wish, sir, to destroy this enchantment, says a Frenchman in 1786. Cruel man, even if it were an illusion, would you still dissipate it? It would be dear to us. It would be useful in consoling the man of virtue. And he might have added, it would be useful too in showing what you could do and what you could get if you tried your own revolution. What you had here was frustration translated into boundless hope. And this feeling produced a kind of philosophy of history, the belief that the American Revolution marked an enormous turning point in the entire history of the human race. One of the most revered of American public documents, the dollar bill, bears on its reverse the date 1776 and the inscription Novus Ordo Seclorum, which means that in that fateful year, 1776, not only was a new nation born, but a new order of human society, free from the sins and the follies of the old Europe. 
The proof of that lay in the fact that George Washington did not become king when the war was over, but returned to his farm at Mount Vernon, which proved that Republicans really were virtuous men like ancient Romans or enlightened philosophers. When Virginia wanted to honor its great Republican hero, it hired the favorite sculptor of the Enlightenment, the Frenchman Houdon. His statue of Washington now stands in the Virginia State Capitol at Richmond, in a building designed by Thomas Jefferson. This is what Tom Paine had to say about the new Republican spirit. What we formerly called revolutions were little more than a change of persons or an alteration of local circumstances. They rose and fell like things of course and had nothing in their existence or their fate that could influence beyond the spot that produced them. But what we now see in the world from the revolutions of America and France are a renovation of the natural order of things, a system of principles as universal as truth and the existence of man, and combining moral with political happiness and national prosperity. The extraordinary thing about this passage is that it was to a great extent true and the main point on which pain seems to be mistaken is not in getting excited about the significance of the American Revolution, but in classing it together with the French Revolution. The American Revolution was different both from that of 17th century England and from that of 18th century France because it took place in a new country and a new world which were not set. And this meant that for once the exalted hopes of the revolutionary idealists were matched by the vast resources of an unexploited continent and by unlimited possibilities of social expansion and experiment. The American leaders had the opportunity to build, not just to fight. In 18th century France, Thomas Jefferson might have put together declarations and constitutions, but he would probably have gone to the guillotine like a lot of revolutionaries. In America, he was able not only to play the big part he did in the formulation of American political thought, but also an effective part as a practical politician in the government and the development of his country. When Jefferson died on July the 4th, 1826, which was also the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, when Jefferson died, he left precise instructions about what should be inscribed on his tomb. He wanted the inscription to say that he had fathered the Declaration of Independence, the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, and the University of Virginia. That's a very American, a very 18th century American selection, coming from a man who had done a lot of other things in his life, including being President of the United States, which he had helped to found. Jefferson's inclusion of the statute for religious freedom is particularly telling. I don't know another revolutionary particularly interested in freedom of thought for others. And I also don't know another revolutionary who founded a university and designed it himself in 1816 as what he called an academic village with individual quarters for students and professors, with gardens, and with a courtyard surrounded by elegant neoclassical buildings, but open on one side to the mountains and the land. On the other hand, this is the man who thought that a little revolution was good now and then, and who wrote that the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants, it is natural manure. 
He wrote that in 1787, just a few years before the French Revolution produced a bit too much blood manure. But still, it's remarkable that this man who would become president could be so forthright. Now, have you ever asked yourselves, in the light of what you know about politics, how Jefferson managed to survive and prosper politically for so long? Was it only by occasionally eating his words? Or was it rather because here in America and here alone, his conception of democracy as a free commonwealth of freeholders liberated from the economic and political servitudes of the old world, free to exploit the resources of this new world, here alone all this was not just a utopian dream. It was a practical policy which could appeal, which did appeal to the Virginia planters, to the Pennsylvania Democrats, to the men on the frontier. And in addition, it was a possible policy because the new United States inherited in its turn the privileged position of the country it had defeated. America, too, and even more so, could be an island like England, inefficient, little governed, and remarkably free. It could do pretty much as it pleased without much interference from outside. American democracy was rude, its structure was clumsy, its politics were wasteful, but it worked. Or so it seemed to foreign observers like the Frenchman Alexis de Tocqueville, who came to see it in 1831 when the Union was half a century old, and who thought he found here the shape of things to come. And the American democracy didn't just work, it moved. After 1850, the United States had reached its present continental limits. After 1853, when the railroad reached Chicago and St. Louis, only Alaska and Hawaii would be missing from the present constellation of states. In this expanding land, where every tenth man or woman was an immigrant, a new nationalism was taking shape. We've listened too long to the refined muses of Europe, wrote Ralph Waldo Emerson. We shall walk on our own feet. We shall work with our own hands. We shall speak according to our own convictions. And these recurrent declarations of independence also were part of the American syndrome of what became an American tradition. So there it was. For nearly three centuries, the Western world had been in bondage to Europe. Now, one portion of it was free. And within a few decades, the vast dominions of Spain and Portugal would also be free from their European masters, if not free from themselves. In April 1789, Washington, the first president of the new republic, took office six days before the French Estates General opened at Versailles, the prelude to quite a different revolution. By 1801, Jefferson was inaugurated the third president of the United States. It was he who directed the planning of the capital city to be named after Washington, a capital which would be laid out on rational, enlightened lines by a French engineer called L'Enfant, whose design would imitate the Romans after whom the new Republicans modeled themselves, massive, dignified, virile, and rather solemn. Washington architecture was supposed to reflect the power of the laws being forged there and the solidity of the new Republic. And certainly there was something quite exceptional about what it stood for then. And it remains exceptional today, nearly two centuries later. Jefferson planned it well. 
although he was buried at Monticello, the Jefferson Memorial in Washington quotes the words of the declaration he was so proud of. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. In our next program, we shall see how these words echo throughout Europe with very different results from those they had in the United States. Until then. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.